So the next session is reset embodied carbon, uh, reduce, reuse, and sequester. Uh, and uh, like the previous session, we'll actually have a panel uh, and we'll uh, go through their panel presentations and then go to Q&A at the end. Uh, so this session addressing embodied carbon, uh, you know, Farhana was talking about really how much of an awakening there's been just in the five years since Paris. And I would say that my experience has been that probably the greatest awakening is about the importance of embodied carbon and how different uh, the, the problem is to, to solving operational carbon. Uh, you know, planning, designing, constructing, and operating buildings has always been a team sport in order, in order to be able to achieve the embodied carbon goals. It really requires, uh, you know, cooperation and collaboration uh, throughout the whole project development, uh, uh, you know, sequence. Uh, as a result of that, that's really why uh, we just brought together the panel that we have with us here today, uh, which uh, uh, represents, you know, design, construction, and then uh, really re research and, and uh, the end of it as well. So our, our three panelists today are Chris O'Hara, one of the founding principals of uh, Studio NYL in Denver, uh, and their firm really is known mostly for their structural design and facade design. Uh, and and uh, actually, Chris is also deeply involved with the Carbon Leadership Forum uh, and also the uh, Structural Engineers 2050 Challenge, which uh, many parallels to the Architecture 2030 Challenge. We also have with us Natalie Weeding from WebCore Builders, uh, she's the assistant sustainability manager there for WebCore. And uh, actually, she and also our next panelist are both environmental management folks, not architectural designers or engineering designers per se. Um, and uh, then our last panelist is Kimberly Siegel with Perkins and Will. Uh, they're a research knowledge manager and again is an envir environmental management trained person. So we have. Uh, you know, good cross-discipline section here. Um, uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris to make his presentation, and then we'll go on to Natalie and Kimberly, and we'll have time for questions at the end. So, uh, Chris, the screen All is right. yours. Well, hopefully I'm going. Thank you uh, for having me, Carl. And, you know, being a structural engineer, I think we got to dive right into the, the two primary culprits of our embodied carbon and the high embodied energy elements of the cement and steel, the cement obviously the binding agent of our concrete elements and two of the most prevalent materials we use in our system. You can see with the circle and the ellipse, they are predominantly heating processes to get these uh, materials made and therefore a lot of um, embodied carbon involved in that. But as we start to look at things, you think back to the the uh, logo for recyc the recycling movement, which also includes the comments of reduce and reuse, and it's things you don't hear enough, and it was we were focusing on recycling bottles and cans. So as we start with reuse, saving our existing buildings, and you know, the, the beauty of some of them, as you can see in the image on the top left, uh, as they start to move beyond their, their life or use by the client, in this case, it's a CSU Laurie Student Center that we worked on with Perkins and Will, the, the owner just couldn't use the building anymore. It wasn't doing what they needed and needed bigger open spaces, higher floor capacities, the building didn't meet seismic needs. So uh, with Perkins and Will, we worked on trying to improve this building rather than demo it as was their original plan to just replace it completely. And using carbon fiber, we were able to increase the floor capacities by 40%, start opening up holes for vertical circulation, uh, bringing light into basements of this building that had never seen light, and of course seismically upgraded so that it could uh, meet modern codes. And you start to see, we also gave it a bit of a facelift in the process as we start bringing some more of this light into the building. And of course, save the heroic concrete elements that we couldn't even afford to build today in the United States. Um, we're also looking at this in terms of our cladding systems where the uh, rather Darth Vader looking building you see on the top left is an existing basketball stadium that leaked in every way possible, air, water, thermal, you name it. And the owner couldn't afford to reclad the building. So we started looking into what can we do about saving what's um, in that facade and uh, moving forward? So aluminum, another high embodied carbon material, 
was able to be saved on this, where we saved all the existing mullions, but in order to get them to perform on an operational level the way we needed, we uh, used a fiber reinforced polymer protrusion that we were able to slide over the existing mullions and then reglaze the system. And through this process, we're actually able to beat most of the thermally broken mullion systems on the market in terms of thermal uh, performance. And then for the opaque cladding, we're able to use that same substructure aluminum thermally break it to a uh, simple rain screen system that we'd see on a conventional new build and be able to save the cost. And that's what we were able to use to sell the idea of the owner. But when you start looking at the embodied carbon savings, it was enormous. And of course, in the process of doing these reclads, we can make some money pretty cool at the same time. Um, coming back into how we're choosing and specifying our materials, you know, once again, concrete being so heavily um, dominated by cement, is one of the critical elements we're always dealing with. And it is one of the most ubiquitous materials we're using for almost everything, whether it's infrastructure or buildings. And one of the moves we're trying to make in the Structural Engineers uh, 2050 group is to move more towards performance-based specifications, where we're giving the manufacturer the ability to tune the mix to what they're able to do best, but putting on stipulations, obviously strength being the first, but also um, put a carbon budget on the material so that and uh, maximum water cement ratios that they're able to use so that we can really start to tune the mix to what we need it to be in terms of the cement contact, uh, the supplementary cementing materials like such as fly ash and things of that nature. And then hopefully this helps encourage them to do a better job of capturing the carbon and the energy in their plants and in their processes and reducing um, that energy on that level. But also um, start to bring in technologies for sequestration of carbon in the concrete. And this is quite frankly is a really long deep dive that you'll hopefully get um, in the latter half of the talk today. Um, steel, well not all steel is created equal when it comes to embodied carbon. So the electric arc furnace versus the basic oxygen furnace, uh, most steel made in the United States tends to use electric arc furnace, which is gonna be able to use obviously less energy, but also be tied to a renewable grid, which is really the big key on that where Many of these oxygen furnaces are using coal-fired plants uh, to develop their heat. And then when we're using the steel, we want to be thinking about this holistically in terms of the other elements that are going to be with it, such as a concrete floor, making sure we're bonding that to our steel. And of course, coarse mass timber, kind of the hero of the embodied carbon uh, world right now, in uh, that it's able to be carbon positive. Uh, many CLT plants are advertising as carbon positive uh, from cradle to gate. So then it becomes part of the challenge of designing it in a manner that we can get it to be cradle to cradle uh, carbon positive. And a lot of that's gonna have to do with the way we detail it. And of course, being able to dismantle it and reuse it later as a, at its end of life, because that's where uh, timber tends to release most of its carbon. But we have to think about these things holistically, because some of the moves we may do to say, reduce steel in a floor system might add concrete in another area and making sure we're balancing all these elements is critical to our design. And then, of course, we can reduce the amount of material we're using uh, through simple uh, use of depth, for example, in terms of a beam. Uh, oftentimes, though, the depth of that beam can start to drive the height of the building up and therefore add other costs and uh, carbon counting that we'll have to deal with. So maybe that wants to find its depth in the form of a truss that is integrated within the floor depth of the building or in the, the story height of the building, or maybe as you start to move to the bottom of the screen, using form and uh, patterns and tessellation to try to find efficiency in our structure. And you really start to see this great in uh, long span um, timber grid shell structures. But uh, one of the, my favorite examples of this, not one of my own, is uh, by SOM, the San Francisco terminal really is indicative of what's going on in the structure, where the structure cantilevers in multiple directions for efficiency. And it's able to find a form that really reflects what's going on in the bending where the maximum bending over the column shows the deepest truss coming down to zero. But we see the same move in big box retail. And they're not doing it because it looks beautiful like the San Francisco terminal. They're doing it because it uses less steel. And oftentimes the selling point that we use for this is less steel means less money, but also means less carbon. So trying to use cantilevers to our advantage is something we do inform quite often. But as we're looking at our different systems and we're weighing different possibilities, we have to Think about the module, what that material does best. You know, it can't be the same grid for concrete as the same grid for steel as the same grid for CLT. We have to optimize the systems to what these materials are doing uh, ideally and sort it out that way and investigate all these options through design. And we often do this with computational design processes like Grasshopper or Dynamo. 
um, in this particular project through a series of tessellation, we're able to reduce the amount of steel in the project by about 30% purely by the way we arrange the steel members uh, through the scripting. And then as we look at different options and we're weighing the cost of these things in terms of cubic yardage or tons of steel, we should also be doing an LCA with each of these options. This is an example of a project we did of going through multiple concrete options and uh, adding the LCA attachment to it so that we knew exactly how much we were spending in these options. And at the end of the day with the LCAs, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Natalie. Natalie? Thank you, Chris. That was a, a great perspective from the structural side. Um, my name is Natalie Weeding. I'm Assistant Sustainability Manager at WebCore Builder. I want to share with you some insights on um, from the perspective of a contractor in tackling embodied carbon. So a little bit about WebCore. We're a general contractor based in California. We've got a very diverse portfolio, including public and private projects, commercial to re residential development. And to date, we've built over 100 million square feet of projects. We have a large scale of impact of construction with the projects we build, and we wanted to make a proactive effort on that building footprint and do our part. This led to our partnership with the Embodied Carbon in Construction Calculator, also known as EC3, in early 2019. So what is EC3? Well, it's a carbon footprinting tool. It utilizes the materials database for benchmarking projects, embodied carbon footprints, and product comparison. It's procurement focused, meaning it looks at opportunities for purchasing at time of procurement. It's not a life cycle tool. You've determined the best performing material type and comparing manufacturers of that material against each other. And why does this matter? To repeat Chris's point, not all products are created equal. You have you can have two products that meet the same performance requirements, but their carbon impact can be drastically different. For example, steel, maybe the electricity produced from a hydro plant will have a significantly lower carbon footprint than electricity sourced from a coal plant. Or concrete mixes with more cement will have a higher carbon impact because the energy required to make cement is very intensive. EC3 enables users to see the range of impact materials have for a given product type and strategically source lower carbon products for that performance need. So how does it work? It's very simple. You take a material quantity and multiply it by the range of potential carbon impacts. And these are known as environmental product declarations. They're essentially like a nutrition label for products, which spits out this footprint model that shows you the range of reduction opportunities for any given material type. In this example, you can see that for cast and place concrete and for concrete in general, there's a significant opportunity for reduction of about 30% just through strategic concrete selection with the mix design. So we see these opportunities in this model in EC3, which begs the question, how do we achieve this? How do we realize these opportunities? This brings me to um, our three key tips of reducing embodied carbon through our experience of piloting EC3 and integrating it into our project delivery model. First is establish the infrastructure. Second is leverage relationships early. And third is frame the narrative. So one, establish the infrastructure. You can't drive embodied carbon down unless you have practices in place that enable you to do so. So WebCore took to, incorporated two key practices into our project delivery model. First was to incorporate environmental product declaration request forms at time of bid. This one educated our trade partners about the importance of EPDs and asking for them up front and two, collected accurate data at time of procurement, early on in the process before we have even procured our materials. Next, we updated our bid evaluation forms so that we could assess our uh, bid proposals, not only based off of cost, which was the standard practice, but also based off of carbon impact. So we can compare cost and carbon collectively during procurement in the pro early in the process. This sets the foundation for us to be proactive about embodied carbon decisions early. Two, leverage relationships early. Many players are involved in building construction. This involves communication both up and downstream. Upstream, we need to start talking about with our clients about 
their strategies to address embodied carbon, walking into interviews and asking how they are approaching embodied carbon. If conversations around carbon can take place early, costs may not be compromised. In downstream, we need to collaborate with our trade partners and communicate the precedent that this is something of value and consideration of embodied carbon. We can incorporate EPDs and embodied carbon into our pre agendas and with trade partners and emphasize that it's not just EPDs that we're asking for, but low carbon EPDs. We've seen this in action in a project that we're currently building in Los Angeles right now. This involved early coordination with the general contractor, WebCore's uh, concrete group, our ready mix supplier, and the structural engineer. Through our early coordination and conversations around meeting the performance requirements, we were able to look at an opportunity to utilize a higher performing aggregate, which required less than it, and in turn ended up saving us nearly 12 million kilograms of CO2 just in the concrete elements alone for this building. And third, we need to frame the narrative. To present the context and framework around tackling embodied carbon as a hero opportunity, a building can be energy efficient, which is definitely helpful at tackling a good chunk of operational emissions. But as we heard earlier, embodied carbon is how we tackle those upfront emissions now. We need to be sure to address embodied carbon to holistically account for emissions in the entire life cycle of the project. Addressing embodied carbon can be seen as a missing piece in a project's corporate responsibility. For example, we went into a discussion with the client showing them their life cycle emissions from embodied and operational carbon using an estimated energy use intensity and assuming that the grid decarbonized by 2050. We showed them that there was an opportunity to reduce the embodied carbon footprint of the structural elements alone through strategic materials procurement by 40%, which equated to 24 million kilograms of CO2 equivalent in savings. But to further make those numbers tangible, we showed them what it looks like in vehicle emissions. This equated to 5,100 passenger vehicles taken off the road in a year. Their eyes lit up through this understanding and they were on board with embodied carbon focused approach to procurement. So what next? Continue the momentum. This is an, a continuously evolving process. It requires everyone to join in. What is great is in, with embodied carbon is that there are already many tools available and the foundation is there. We just need you to build on that foundation with true application. I can't emphasize enough the role of collaboration that plays in getting everyone on board to push forward these initiatives. I think we continue to keep hearing that emphasis and point around collaboration. And start now. We're already seeing the impacts of climate change around us. These efforts require direct action. Start establishing the infrastructure, leveraging relationships early, and framing the narrative around embodied carbon reduction opportunities. Now I'll hand off to Kimberly to share her perspectives from Perkins and Will. Thank you. Great, thanks Natalie. Um, hello everyone. My name is Kimberly Siegel and I'm a research knowledge manager at Perkins and Will. And before I get into the meat of my presentation this morning, I think it's really important to reiterate some of the points you've already heard. So although embodied carbon has been around for a while, it wasn't until relatively recently that the topic started to gain incredible momentum in the AEC industry. And that's directly due to more data and transparency. We've known how to calculate and quantify operational carbon or the carbon that goes into powering a building for a while. And now with greater product specific data, we can take a more targeted approach to embodied carbon. Embodied carbon in this image is all um, of the blue. It represents all the carbon that's emitted before the building is actually complete and even after it's no longer in use. So together, operational and embodied carbon paint the complete picture and help us think holistically. So while life cycle assessments were previously how we understood it, now we have product specific data to quantify embodied carbon, which fits into the overall sustainability narrative, which has been an ongoing dynamic discussion for decades. So, pardon me, go back one slide. Um, for us, sustainability is just a part of who we are at Perkins and Will. It's not separate from our design work, but merely one facet of it. It's driven from the top down, the bottom up, and everywhere in between. These conversations are dynamic, and while the approach to tackle questions can be prescriptive, the content changes for each project and each design. This can range from buildings that meet path without standards, 
and buildings that are LEED certified. Um, in 2011, we completed life cycle assessments for both Van Dusen and SPURS, which are featured here on this slide. And that set the foundation for a lot of our mass timber work. So you can see past efforts impact future designs. Other aspects of sustainability include buildings that meet zero net energy, adaptive reuse buildings that conserve materials, which is a, um, a definite fan favorite and a great strategy for embodied carbon reduction. Um, additionally, material health is folded into sustainability discussions, and we design buildings where materials are vetted against our precautionary list to ensure we're not specifying toxic chemicals. So sustainability for us is also about um, projects that engage the community. Holistic living design integrates all these aspects, designs that shine because collaboration led to great ideas. Um, and you'll see here, these are two projects that my fellow panelists and I, our companies have worked on together. So it's all about leveraging our past connections to have these conversations to move the needle forward about embodied carbon. So much like the sustainability indicators I just mentioned, carbon can be a part of project DNA and it can inspire design. As we enter into this new phase of understanding how our designs can improve carbon reduction, it's important to reflect on some of the lessons we've learned and apply them as we forge a path ahead. So really quickly, um, this is a succinct bulleted list that I, I think um, captures it pretty, pretty well. First and foremost, it's never too early to start the discussion, um, not only on sustainability, but also on embodied carbon. And this can mean that as soon as you get an RFP, an RFQ, any kind of request for a project out there, you can start to think about how embodied carbon fits into the equation of, of the proposed project. Um, across, communication across teams is critical, and I don't just mean your internal teams here, I mean your entire project team from clients, owners, operators, contractors, consultants, engineers, uh, subcontractors, you name it. Um, also, all stakeholders involved. I think as long as you're communicating what you're intending to do in terms of embodied carbon reduction, it'll give an opportunity for a lot more ideas to be generated and a path forward will kind of appear based on um, a variety of different input. Rely on existing tools. There's been a lot of work that's been done in order to um, get us where we are today. And those tools are great. They've been vetted, they've been used. And since time is of the essence, in terms of taking action on body carbon reduction, I highly advocate for using existing tools. And lastly, embrace the unknown. Um, this, is, this is changing the way that we're working with our teams, and there's still a lot that we're learning as we begin to more specifically integrate in body carbon reduction into our projects. There's a lot of filling in the blanks, and my suggestion is just embrace it. Um, it's not going to be perfect, but we'll eventually get there. So if we're still fine-tuning how we, are, we approach in body carbon, it means we need to ask questions. And for us at Perkins Will, part of our inquiry began with signing up to become a pilot partner to the ECP tool. So this by the numbers snapshot right here shows how we harness momentum. Um, it started with a pilot partnership back in March of 2019. From there, we cast a wide net to see who wanted to be an early adopter of the tool across our firm. We initiated a 40 member um, embodied carbon working group. That number continues to grow every month. Um, those members represent 14 of our different studios and collectively we've nominated 25 of our active projects to target an approach for embodied carbon reduction, either through life cycle assessments or through piloting the EC3 tool, just different ways to understand how embodied carbon fits into our project work. This image right here um, helps us visualize the body carbon reduction process. So with the availability of environmental product declarations, making data more specific and more available and transparent, not only can our design team fully understand what's, what's available, um, it also helps to have broader discussions with the entire uh, project team. So as I mentioned, rely on existing tools. This is a quick snapshot of the existing tool landscape. Um, anything from EC3, Tally, Athena, one-click LCA. These are all exceptional tools serving different functions across a similar ob objective. And I think it's um, really useful for us to turn to them right now as we try to incorporate this into our work. 
So I mentioned our Embodied Carbon Working Group, and thanks to the fact that most of us are virtual these days, I actually have a snapshot of what that looks like. Um, this is a, a picture from our last monthly meeting. Um, this is how we come together to knowledge share, to talk about what's happening specifically in our different regions and what's going on with our different practice areas. Um, you'll see here on this clip, um, our, my colleagues Jesse and Elton in our Seattle and Vancouver practices, they created a pretty comprehensive carbon practice guide. And so they've asked us to review it and you'll see all the little cursors moving around represent all the different members that are logged in. And as they're reviewing their different flow charts and diagrams and their step-by-step -step kind of outline of how to consider and body carbon in your work, they've asked all of us to go in and provide feedback and input based on our own experiences. So you can really see here, we're learning together and sharing what we know. Um, so what's next? And if you're interested in checking out what that practice, carbon practice guide looks like, feel free to click on that link. Um, you know, for right now, we're just taking the opportunity to write the next chapter of embodied carbon reductions with our partners. So that's, that's everyone on a project team, that's people in our industry, that's academics, that's vendors, that's, that's, it takes everyone. Um, we have the framework outlined with the help of tools like EC3 and Tally and OneClick and, and Athena, but it's up to us to fill in the missing pieces and craft our stories for our unique teams and clients and regions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kimberly. Terrific presentation. And thanks also to Natalie and Chris for a really wonderful uh, panel discussion here. We've got a few minutes for questions, uh, so uh, I thought we'd just jump right in. Um, and uh, I start with uh, a question for each of you um, with the various roles that uh, you know each of you represents. What about focusing on embodied carbon has kind of changed your sense about your role, but then also uh, uh, how has it changed your sense about what you depend on the others around you to help you with? So, um, Chris, you want to start with that? Well, for me, I guess seeing the the data that's out there in terms of what my role contributes to uh, carbon emissions in terms of primary structure, steel, concrete, things of that nature, it, it uh, puts a pretty heavy load of responsibility on us and uh, we take that to heart. We've always been talking about um, embodied carbon for at least the last 20 years, but back then it was called embodied energy and things of that nature. Like when we did the CSU project with Perkins and Will, it was really about trying to save that building and preventing it from going to landfill. Getting the full gist of the, um, the carbon emissions that went with the energy was something we learned over the next decade. Uh, so for us, it's been something we always try to do. And it's one of those things that's always been frustrating when you look at the various metrics like lead and things like that, that are wonderful carrots to get our um, owners to try to do a little bit better than we did before. But when you look at structure as it related to those, we get like one innovation point for carbon fiber on CSU, uh, saving 50% of the steel in a roof system gets you one innovation point. So we're right up there with bike racks. Uh, so now seeing the better attention to it, we can really start to enact better change in terms of more elegant structures that are using material better. And maybe there's a balance on labor to try to get less material, but uh, I feel like people are a little more receptive to it. So it's kind of fun for us. Natalie, how about your perspective uh, as a builder? Yeah, I think the more familiarity we develop with embodied carbon, I, I feel we have all taken on a role as an educator in the process and educating everyone that contributes to the project, whether it's from a financial perspective, from a structural perspective, from an operational, educating them on the inherent value of embodied carbon. Chris, I think your point around lead and it only being one point really um, emphasizes that, that we need to educate it beyond a point value. It's about much more than that and how we're contributing to our whole ecosystem when it comes to emissions and, and how that there's this inherent responsibility that we have in that process. And since we are carrying that knowledge base, we have that 
we develop that responsibility as an educator to educate others about that responsibility and those opportunities that we can have um, in taking a leadership role around embodied carbon, that it's a collective action that we all have to, to take responsibility for. And Kimberly, how about you? What thoughts do you have to add? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not like broken record, just kind of echoing what Chris and Natalie have just said, but um, it is all about collective action. And, you know, Chris had mentioned that this, this conversation has been around for a while, except it was formerly known as embodied energy. And it, it's, it's true. Um, there's, there's a precedent already in our industry for mechanical engineers and architects to work together to kind of work on the operational energy and, and lowering the EUI of our buildings, but now with embodied carbon and the advent of so much more information and tools that are at our disposal, it invites everyone else on the project team to get involved in the discussion early on from structural engineers, contractors, owners. I mean, the decision making can start. It doesn't need to wait until um, you know late stage design. It can happen early on, even in a project kickoff. And so it, it's. I think it's hopefully changing the conversation in that regard. So there's a couple of uh, questions that came in that are pretty specific. Um, the, the first is about just, you know, baseline performance specs and, and data and things like that. Um, uh, uh, do uh, each of you feel like you're beginning to see the quality of data about things like, for example, concrete and steel uh, that's actually getting to the point where you, where you have a, a sense of confidence about the information that you're really working with? Well, I, I think, think we need to matter, continue. But... Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Natalie. Yeah, I, I think we're both making about to make a similar point. I think we have to continue measuring. So I think we've got a good foundation of collecting that information. But I think it comes with more case studies and more benchmarking and, and more buy-in to collect that information. And how how do you uh, how do you see that information being shared? Is it readily shared or is is this something where you really have to dig to try to get your hands on proprietary information? Where is the information coming from? Yeah, well, I think this is a recurring thing that's been coming up through this whole teaching is that we're relying on collaboration. And I think that there's value in making this information publicly available because we need to understand how our buildings are performing holistically. So our, our intent is to have that information available in the long run so that we can use that to compare. I mean, we're, from a general contractor's perspective, we want to see how all of our colleagues are performing as well from what they're procuring. So the more information you can get, the more you know, sound the data can be as you collect it. So with that, that concept and, and idea of collaboration, we'd want to aggregate this, that data regardless of who's owning it. Anyone else want to add a thought on this? Yeah, I, I think there's still a level of imperfection in the data, but you know, even slightly bad data is better than none. And you know, it gives us a better opportunity to move forward. And I look at the kind of data we were using, you know, 10 years ago. Really, we're just trying to reduce, say, steel tonnage or cubic yards of concrete or cement content. Now we can be more specific of knowing you know exactly which plants are producing at a, a lower uh, carbon emissions. We can know uh, what types of steel are produced better. Like for example, a wide flange beam is going to be less carbon intensive of a tube steel of the same weight. Things like that, we can be way more specific than we ever could. Is it perfect yet? No, but it's a much better data that we can start to build into our algorithms as we start to study these systems. But last but not least, is kind of a, a, a uh, flipping around a little different perspective on a lot of what you've already talked about, and that is, uh, uh, how do you see this really helping your competitive advantage? Are clients looking at you uh, as uh, you know leaders in the profession? Is uh, this something where you're really, really beginning to see the recognition? of the importance of embodied carbon in, in how uh, the clients are coming to you and then also how 
how your uh, collaborators in the professions are, are relating to you. Is this, is this an important topic for how you're identified in the, in the profession and the field? I think there's two ways to answer that because it's certainly important to us from an internal perspective. And I think I believe it's important to our clients. Um, a lot of it can be um, driven by regional demands or reg regulations or policies, um, but that certainly won't stop our designers if they're in regions where this isn't a concern or the, the clients don't necessarily haven't been educated yet about embodied carbon and the advent of these new tools. And so for us, it's, it, I sound like I'm repeating what I just presented, but it is part of our DNA. It's a part of how we approach, approach things and understanding the full impact, the holistic impact of everything that we're doing that includes embodied carbon. Um, it's really important for us. And so we're leveraging our internal programs. We, you know, we, we have a lot of internal research that happens and small scale innovation incubator projects to large scale research projects. And on both levels, we're, we're really targeting understanding what embodied carbon reduction looks like and what that means for our future. Yeah, I, I think for us, the people we're working with, because uh, we generally work for architects, our people already had that mindset and that, that mindset's just kind of evolved more into embodied carbon. So I guess my answer to your question is I hope so, because they're the ones who are really seeing the benefits hopefully from marketing um, the embodied carbon uh, stance and the way they're thinking about it. And hopefully that means the owners are caring more about it. I know there are a lot of you know big Fortune 500 companies who are making distinct um, moves in that direction of all their built work, but we want to see that being more and more uh, the norm as opposed to the exception. Yeah, and I'd say the selling point for a contractor is being able to speak to it before it's brought up to you. So being able to proactively start that conversation and present it to a client rather than having to respond from a client coming and in, in requiring it downstream. So there's definitely an advantage for us in being able to bring that option to the table before um, it becomes a standardized practice as this added service that um, clients haven't necessarily seen as commonplace conversations with contractors before. So we definitely want it to be a more commonplace conversation in the future. And to build on that, I think we want to make it so that it's not a service we can provide it's a service we're providing regardless of whether we're asked. I mean, it's just like you say, it's the DNA. It's, it's just what we do now. And if they don't want to read that column of the uh, spreadsheet that says what the embodied carbon is, I guess that's their business to ignore it. But, you know, we're going to give it to them anyway and force them to acknowledge it. Well, that's all the time we have. I want to uh, thank our fantastic panel for your presentations and also for your response to these questions. So Chris O'Hara with Studio NYL, Natalie Weeding with WebCore Buildings, and uh, Kimberly Siegel with Perkins and Will. Thanks very much for a really engaging and informative uh, panel on embodied carbon. Uh, clearly, this is a direction for the future of uh, our, the building industry and the built environment design and construction. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.